Edgerton's boomer illustrates the induction of a current in a conductor subjected to a time-varying magnetic field and the associated magnetic forces. It illustrates the interplay between the laws of Faraday, Ampere, and Ohm that determines the distribution, duration, and magnitude of currents in conductors under magneto-quasi-static conditions. This is the coil. The winding wire circulates like so and is connected to the capacitors in this cabinet by these leads. When the high voltage power supply in the cabinet is turned on, the capacitor is charged to four kilovolts. The switch then connects the capacitor to the coil. It's closed when this button is pushed. The switch consists of a spark gap, which we just heard. We can see it if we open this panel. The switch is closed by a spark across this gap. That spark is activated by applying a voltage to this electrode to make a smaller electrical breakdown in the gap. Just once, we'll bypass the safety interlock that ordinarily disconnects the circuit when the panel is opened. Then, when we push the button, we can not only hear the spark discharge that closes the switch, but see the associated flash as well. Maybe we can do it once more. Given the initial capacitor voltage of four kilovolts and that the coil has 50 turns, we can use basic principles to estimate the winding current and hence the magnetic field intensity produced by the coil. First, we use Ampere's integral law to relate the current to the field. The line contour encloses the current in the coil. Before we go on, let's see how well we've approximated the current and field. This current probe will link one of the wires connected to the coil. We display the coil current on the lower scope trace. The voltage induced at the terminals of this coil by the time varying magnetic flux density will be used to deduce B. This voltage will be displayed as the upper scope trace. Here are the responses to the discharge of the capacitor. The time axis is two tenths of a millisecond per division. So the period of the oscillation is about one third of a millisecond. The oscillation frequency is roughly the predicted 4 kilohertz. The duration of the lower trace current and hence of the field is on the order of 1 millisecond. The peak in the current on the lower trace is about one division. There are 1,000 amps per division, so the peak current is about 1,000 amps. This is in the range of the estimated value of 1,600 amps. Remember, we've not accounted for losses in the spark gap in the coil. The disk could represent a hand. In that case, the experiment can literally give a feel for the consequence of subjecting a conductor to a time-varying magnetic field. If the disk represents a hand, what current density would be felt? magnetic field created by the coil is non-uniform. 
far away that of a dipole. So we can discern what we're getting into by feeling the induced current in stages. The sensation is of a short duration twinge, much as would be expected for a pulse that lasts one millisecond. Uh, I've been given to understand that Professor Zahn is not going to try it with his hand lower than this, so that you can see evidence of the field that you can't feel firsthand. Let's replace his hand by this wire loop the wire is open at this point, with the ends barely touching. So the field induced around the contour is concentrated at the gap. We go to a higher f-stop to protect the camera. The integral of the electric field intensity is concentrated in a gap region that is initially relatively insulating. So the electric field intensity between the almost touching wires is enough to produce a spark. The conductivity of this aluminum disc is more than 10 million times larger than for human flesh. And there's no gap to limit the induced current. The force can be used to shape metals. Here, the upward force is evident in the shaping of the outer edge of a foil disc. For this experiment, we used three times as much capacitance. If the force can be used to shape the metal, it can also be used to launch the disc. I'm Melcher, and as you know, that's Zahn. We've brought along an illuminary here to push that button finally. This is Professor Doc Edgerton, and uh, it's his machine. What we've done, of course, is to show you this disc. And now, if uh, Doc, you turn on your machine. Ready? Here we go. I'm going to step out of this. I'll turn on the main power. Let the corrupt the charge. <laughs> I'll do it again. Do you have a favorite one there? <laughs> well, the, everyone's a little different. Let's try this one. What do you say? Power. A little different ring to it. A little different ring. Now, as I understand it, this thing's got uh, more capacitors in it. Maybe we get Zahn to uh, put a little more in yeah, there? Yeah, you like to have a little yeah, now, there? Yeah, sure. one okay. of the reasons I brought this man along is that, uh, in fact, he mainly paid for this building. So, you see, we don't care too much if we hurt that ceiling. It'd be nice to have an imprint up there, wouldn't it? Right. With you here, I can say that. Okay, let's see what happens this time. Well, you got three capacitors on instead of one. It should go a little higher. One, two, three, go. <laughs> <laughs> Missed me. <laughs> Want to try our favorite? Yeah, note? let's try that one. <laughs> hey, knocked a hole in the ceiling. <laughs> well, I can see you enjoy that, huh? <laughs> All right. Thank yep. you very much, sir.